I am not for uh, having either the government or uh, you know tech companies ultimately be the arbiter of truth. Uh, I'm for making sure censorship that uh, we don't have speech that incites violence. But I'm very wary of censorship. In fact, you know, in the book I write about uh, how uh, I, I thought it was a mistake for Twitter to take down some of this stuff about Hunter Biden or or, uh, or Facebook to do that. And I think that story was total hogwash. I think Joe Biden was unfairly attacked because of his son, but that doesn't mean that it didn't belong in the public sphere. Congressman Ro Khanna, thanks so much for joining us today for the American Optimist. I'm excited to be on. Thanks for having me with good company, Stephen Harper and Ashton Kutcher. Yep. I'll, I'll try not to ruin the clicks. <laughs> Well, I'm excited to have you on, partially because I respect you, but we don't agree on everything. And so it'll be fun because you and I have a lot of different views to, to go through. But before yeah. before we dive in, uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background. Your parents came to the U.S. from India, right? In 1975 from, from India. My dad had come earlier. He went to the University of Michigan uh, to finish up his education, chemical engineering. Uh, I was born in Philadelphia in 1976. You know, my father was a chemical engineer as well, actually. That's funny. I didn't realize really? that. Really? Yeah. 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 No, so he, he still roots for uh, Michigan. It was a tough, tough loss in the semifinals, uh, but they beat Ohio State, which is what, what matters for him. Awesome. Uh, and then I grew up, uh, grew up outside Philadelphia. Your grandfather was part of the Indian independence movement. Is that right? Indian independence movement, yeah, in jail for four years uh, during in the 1940s during the Quit India movement. And then was part of the first Indian Congress that uh, was established under Nehru's prime ministership. So uh, it, I find him a very inspiring figure of standing up for human rights and standing up for independence. What, what, what was the impact your parents' lives had on you in terms of their coming over here to America? Uh, it was one of uh, education. I mean, they said, look, you've got every opportunity in this country. Go work hard. Go study hard. Uh, it was uh, one of family. I mean, we... Uh, you really, as an immigrant f a family, would uh, care deeply about uh, uh, closeness uh, with them, my brother, uh, with friends that we had. Uh, and uh, I think it was one that, that, that anything in this country is possible. I mean, they uh, understood what promise uh, America had. No, that's awesome. Has. So, so, you know, Ro, in an era of real, maybe some might call it hyper-partisanship, You've actually introduced multiple pieces of legislation that were signed into law, even by a Republican president, even though, you know, you're, you're more known. I, I, do you consider yourself a, a progressive Democrat? Is, or how yes. Do you, yeah. uh, progressive capitalist. Progressive, though. Progressive so. capitalist. Progressive capitalist. I love it. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the two, two different extremes <laughs> combined. Uh, so, you know, what, one of them was your Valor Act, I believe, and made it easier for companies to offer veterans apprenticeships. Uh, you know, what, yes. what, what, what's your strategy for working across the aisle? How are you, how are you building productive relationships with people when, when it's so polarized? I try not to demonize people's motives. I try not to question uh, what moves them or call them liars or call them uh, names. Um, I will strongly disagree with them. I'd say your policies are going to hurt the working class. Your policies are going to hurt uh, American strength. But I don't, I, wherever I can, I try not to personalize it. And I think if you don't personalize disagreement and you keep disagreement on what your policy differences are, uh, then you're able to work uh, work more. People trust you to work with you. No, that's that's good advice for all of us. And 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 you you represent most of Silicon Valley, and you become sort of an ambassador for Silicon Valley, working to create tech hubs across you know across the country, especially rural America. Could you tell us more about that? How you think of that effort? It's my biggest passion. Look. I, the Valley, as you know, because you've been a driver of it, uh, has created, in my view, more wealth uh, than probably any region in human history. I mean, $11 trillion market cap in the Silicon Valley region. Uh, and there are going to be 25 million digital jobs by 2025. We cannot have a nation where a few places, Silicon Valley, Austin, Seattle, uh, Boston, are driving the modern wealth generation, are driving the job opportunities, and large swaths of the rest of the country are left out. Uh, people should be able to live in their hometown and have jobs of the future, and they should be able to build wealth uh, where they're living. Uh, I think the pandemic actually provides that opportunity with rethinking remote work, with rethinking whether ever, everyone has to move to Palo Alto or Austin. I like, you know, I, I, I like how you're thinking about this. One of my 
good friends, Arthur Brooks, who ran AAI. He talks a lot about human dignity and everyone deserves dignity. And I think it's interesting that both you and he are using that term dignity. And, you know, and you, you're talking about dignity in a digital age. Like, how, how, how do you think about that? What, what does everyone deserve? What are you, what are you trying to say? Well, I think, uh, appreciate you mentioning Dignity in a Digital Age, my forthcoming book, but the reason I chose that title is, uh, yes, dignity is about making sure you have uh, health care and making sure you have education and making sure you live in a, a safe neighborhood and with family, but dignity is also the ability to contribute, the ability to make a contribution uh, to your community, to your family, to your society. People want to be able to be productive. People want to be able to uh, generate value. And what I'm saying is you can't just, I'm, I'm not for this idea that, okay, let's have all the wealth generated in a few parts of the country and then send everyone else a check. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to have the pre-distribution of opportunity, not just redistribution post-production. And that's what I talk about is dignity. How do we give people those opportunities to be value creators yep. in a 21st century economy? I, I love that. It's so interesting to me that you're coming from the progressive side and, and Arthur is coming from, from you know, what he calls the compassionate conservative side. And you both care about people being needed, having the dignity of their work actually being valued as opposed to just getting a check. I, I, I think that's really great. Uh, on the, you know, on tech in general, t speaking about your role as an ambassador, row, you know, it's had an incredible run, obviously, over the past decades, and it's kind of put a target on the back of tech in D.C., you know, for, for a lot of reasons. I think some of them maybe are justified, maybe some are not merited. You, you founded and co-chaired the Antitrust Caucus in the House, right? So, so you're, you're obviously thinking a lot about this. Like, what should a balanced regulatory environment for the tech space look like? What, like, like what should we be using antitrust against and what should we be saying, oh, this is not something to attack? I think antitrust should be one that increases consumer choice and consumer welfare. So how do we make sure that uh, platforms are uh, not squelching uh, competitors? And how do we make sure that platforms are providing access to uh, a wide range of options? But I'm not for just reflexively breaking up companies. Let me give you two concrete examples. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it seems to me reasonable to say, uh, well, while we, while we want to have certain marriages and acquisitions, because that's an exit strategy, I'm sure, you know, a lot of people fund venture capital and they hope that there will be a <laughs> it'd, it'd be hard to you do know. my job if I couldn't sell the companies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not for one of those folks who says, let's just ban all mergers and acquisitions, though there are some of those voices in, 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 in Congress. But, you know, I'm not for allowing uh, acquisitions where it looks like things could emerge as co competition. So we may disagree on this. I don't think that Facebook should have been allowed to acquire Instagram and WhatsApp. People will say, oh, you didn't know. And it was Facebook that helped them grow. I think people knew by then they could have been alternative spaces. And uh, so where there's actual uh, efforts of squelching uh, a potential competitor, uh, I would have more scrutiny uh, on that kind of deal, or at least the presumption then be being that it should be anti-competitive and you have to show it's not but that and that the, assu yeah. the assumption has to be that something's already so big and profitable that it has so much power in the economy that it, that it shouldn't be allowed to because obviously if something's smaller so like you know you probably know the history of paypal elon musk you know had x.com and peter thiel had confinity and they merged to become paypal and, and both of them were probably going to die otherwise that was the only way they could right. survive was to merge so it's an interesting question like when do you allow competitors to merge and work together when when do you not yeah and 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 i think the balance it's always a balance right i mean so we probably uh it shouldn't go to the other extreme where we don't allow it at all and there are times where it's necessary and there are times where it, it's it's good but you know even if you're conservative you should be for having a plurality of discursive spaces and not just having uh your facebook make all, all the decisions of what is good good speech or bad speech right which they they have the right to do on their platform so you should be for a multiplicity of options uh just like we have in television we don't just have three broadcast networks so, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a good it's a good argument you want competition how do you think about this for healthcare? because you know in our country there's all these local monopolies and all these healthcare systems have bought everyone up and there's for profit healthcare systems. But as you know, there's also very powerful nonprofit healthcare systems that have bought everyone up in certain areas, pay people insane salaries. They're effectively functioning like for profit companies, but they're called nonprofit. And, 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 and there's really no antitrust against them. Is that is that the kind of stuff you guys should look at as well? Or, or is tech more of the bigger sure. focus? Yeah, sure. There, look, the American sickness is a great book and it talks about all of the waste and uh, abuse in the healthcare system. For example, certain hospitals charge these exorbitant facility fees, and then no one is uh, looking at that ad 
exor exorbitant cost. I mean, obviously, we could talk about the cost that insurance uh, adds mm -hmm. to, to, to the system. We could talk about the cost uh, of the shortages in, uh, in, in certain doctors and nurses and that what that adds to the system. So if antitrust is not allowing, uh, if the violation of antitrust is driving up prices, that is something that, of, uh, of course, we should look at. Do you, do you think tech is the biggest problem from antitrust or are, are all these equally important or how do you guys prioritize what you, what you look at? So when I look at tech, I, I don't think that antitrust is the single biggest issue with tech, in my view. I think there are two bigger issues with tech. I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't have antitrust enforcement on tech, but the first bigger issue is even if you had five Googles in my district and surrounding areas, what does that mean for Youngstown, Ohio? What does that mean for Beckley, West Virginia? So my mm -hmm. bigger issue is how do we distribute the opportunity in a tech-generated economy with 25 million digital jobs for people in places outside Silicon Valley or Austin or Seattle to thrive? You know, people kept saying, oh, look, everyone's moving and, and half of them were going to Austin and Seattle. That's not exactly democratizing the innovation economy. The second mm -hmm. issue is uh, if these places are creating the public's sphere of the 21st century, as newspapers did, as cable news did, yeah. that's a huge obligation. Uh, what does it mean in terms of censorship? What does it mean in terms of the obligation of misinformation versus free speech? What does it mean in terms of having a conversation of equality? Uh, those are very big issues. And what does it mean for privacy? Yep. A third part is antitrust. But a lot of times people just say antitrust because they're fearful of the first two. And they don't, and it's not like antitrust will solve these more fundamental anxieties. I like that. In the public sphere thing, it sounds like people on both the right and the left agree it's it's too much power to give any one business to control the public sphere. And what what are what are some of the ideas you guys have for that? Are there is there good legislation being worked on? How do we how do we address censorship in the public sphere? Well, there one I guess here I will uh, uh, say that antitrust does have a role in making sure we have multiplicity of social discursive spaces emerge and. Uh, to the extent that we can decentralize things. You know, Dorsey, I think, before we left Twitter, was talking about having individuals have more control over their own algorithms, over their own content. I think those things are, uh, are healthy. Uh, but we also need uh, basic regulation, in my view, on consumer safety. And we may disagree here, but you know, if Facebook has information that Instagram is causing depression and anxiety among teenagers, mm -hmm. well, they, there ought to be con basic consumer safety regulations that doesn't allow that. So uh, I, I think that that has to be there. But I, I am not for uh, having either the government or uh, you know, tech companies ultimately be the arbiter of truth. Uh, I'm for making sure censorship that uh, we don't have speech that incites violence, but I'm very wary of censorship. In fact, you know, in the book I write about uh, how uh, I, I thought it was a mistake for Twitter to take down some of this stuff about Hunter Biden or, or, uh, or Facebook to do that. And I think that story was total hogwash. I think Joe Biden was unfairly attacked because of his son, but that doesn't mean that it didn't belong in the public sphere. Yep. No, that's fascinating. I, you know, I, I like I like what you said about the responsibility my my instinct as like a maybe a 12 year old libertarian would be to say oh no, it's not their problem but but you know it, it really does seem you know I have, I have three daughters now and it really does seem like these social media companies are kind of like drugs right they they they, they capture your brain and they addict you and they and, and 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 you know josh josh Hawley on the from the opposite side of the aisle he he was saying they should be regulated like drugs i don't know if that's actually true or not but it's, it sounds like you and he might agree on some things there where there's certain things they're doing that are kind of taking advantage of young people's minds and, and screwing with them we should we, you think government should be looking into that making sure it's appropriate i do i think holly is uh a little bit too sensational i mean i <laughs> look the top nine out of the top 10 sites on facebook are conservative sites with uh, Donald Trump and Hannity and Ben Shapiro and others. So, uh, and I don't have this view that uh, all Americans are so manipulable that uh, somehow because of Facebook, they aren't capable of free critical thinking. Yeah. I do have a concern though, particularly with minors. And that's where maybe we would agree where you have teenagers where basically it's like your worst experience in junior high magnified uh, and now with algorithms and there there should be regulation there and there should be some regulation to make sure that these uh, these spaces aren't used to incite violence. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that uh, there is area. There are areas for common ground in, in how we approach these these issues. I love it. That, that makes sense. I want to I want to shift maybe to a controversial topic is if you have if you have an opinion on it, I want to talk a little bit about 
income inequality and billionaires. And you've probably seen the back and forth recently between Elon Musk and Senator Warren. Uh, you know, Elon, Elon obviously is a complicated person, but he's an, he's an immigrant. He's building companies that are solving some of our biggest challenges. I mean, at a highest level, shouldn't we be celebrating that success? And, and, and like the fact that he's like so, so good at creating all this wealth and solving these problems, is that, should that be the highest level order here or, 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 or what are people missing? Yes, I asked Elon to blurb my first book, which he did, and I don't know if he'd do it now, but, but back in 2012 <laughs> on manufacturing. Uh, so I have a lot of respect for uh, his entrepreneurship and innovation. Here's where I uh, disagree with him. Uh, he, and I think he would admit this, uh, got a lot of loans from the U.S. government for mm -hmm. Tesla. Mm -hmm. And it, Tesla may not have happened if that weren't the case. And then he smartly repaid them early because he didn't want the government to get the rewards and reap all the profits if he had paid it on time. It was all legal. Yeah. But I think he should just acknowledge that Elon uh, has done a lot of things, but his uh, his ability and his ability to succeed was was because of the greatness of our nation. It was because of all of the things that our nation allows, uh, and that there was a role of the government in 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 supporting it. And that doesn't diminish Elon Musk. It doesn't diminish his uh, innovation or entrepreneurship. No, that that, that makes sense. And, and, and Ro, you were co-chair of Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign. Yes. On why so much focus from him going after billionaires? Aren't, aren't there so many problems to attack? Are billionaires really the root of a lot of our problems? Or is that just a populist thing that, that gets lots of votes? Or how do we think about this? Well, Ezra Klein once asked me, uh, he's a columnist uh, now for the New York Times, would you outlaw billionaires? And I said, no. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think, uh, you know, if Steve Jobs wants to go make uh, Apple computers and makes billions of dollars doing that, fine. I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. I think we will have a disagreement on how much they should pay in taxes. I don't think, you know, the, the, I'm for a wealth tax, and I know a lot of your uh, listeners probably aren't. You know, one of the things they say is, oh, if you have a wealth tax, everyone's going to go and uh, take their capital out of the United States. Give me a break. 93%, 93% of American investment is in America. You know why? Because it's the best place to invest. And if someone is foolish enough to go take their money outside America and not invest in Silicon Valley because of a 1% or 2% tax, uh, do it. Uh, America is going to still, it would be a dumb bet. Like they, we still have the largest growth possibility. And so I just don't think there's going to be some mass capital flight. Now, if you're France, you got to worry about it because there could be mass capital I, flight. I, 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 and I understand at the high level where you're coming from. So I, I personally, actually, I'll put it out there. Uh, the, the fifth company that I founded to have crossed a billion dollar mark happened last week. So I've started a lot of big companies. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's in defense doing important work there called Epris, really important company. I guess I shouldn't announce it yet because the round's still private, but that's okay. Um, but, you know, so I, on paper, if you add everything up, I'm a billionaire on paper. Uh, I'm not actually that liquid at all. Palantir is the only one that went public and I've invested all that money since then. So, so for me, a 10 or $20 million tax actually is a lot of money. I'd have to go borrow it, I guess, against these companies that are very volatile. I could probably borrow the money for a few years, but I'd get kind of, I get kind of worried if in two or three years if things don't go public for a bit, you know, it'd be, it'd be nerve, nerve wracking. So I'm curious how you think about this for, there's a lot of people building wealth, you know, I'm in my late thirties. I'm building a lot of wealth right now. I'm not like one of the, like the crazy liquid billionaire, you know, people like Larry Ellison right. or Mark Zuckerberg. But you Zuckerberg. would be a billionaire on paper. You would, on you're paper. saying your net I'm, worth. I'm a net worth on paper is a billionaire, but I'm like, I'm building yeah. wealth. I'm pretty illiquid. I can, I, I have, a, I have, you know, a couple of nice houses or whatever, but it's not like, right. but, but it's not like I'm, I'm not like I'm throwing all the cash around yet. So, so, so how, how should these taxes work when people are building wealth? And it doesn't, it seem, it seems to me like there's a lot of distortions they would create if we're not careful with what we people want to put in place. Well, we should be careful about a one or two percent tax. I mean, there would be, as you said, you could borrow the money on the assets and pay the tax. And then if there was, you could probably get it refunded if there was some grand if crash and all your companies, you know, crash and you actually weren't net worth that net worth. And you, you know, you should be allowed to then deduct that. Uh, but I think there are ways of setting it up. The, the point is, though, that here's where I think we could find common ground. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's anything inherently evil in be becoming a billionaire. I think a lot of times it's based on innovation, creativity, hard work. And I think you can say, OK, and because you've done so well, that you have an obligation to to pay uh, more in tax. Uh, and we can say what that right point is so that everyone yeah. can have education and health care. You know, so people talk about folks in the valley being self-made. And that's largely true in the sense that it's not dynastic wealth. 
But if you look at the stories of most of them, they largely came from stable families. They largely had a good mm -hmm. education. They didn't have huge health care issues. Yeah. And so what I'm talking about is how do we get folks that those basics? And 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 no, and, and I, I think I think on the side of getting people basics, I think I, I think we're aligned. I, I guess we we probably have different views on how much taxes can just can distort things. I'm, I'm curious, like like health healthcare row is something I'm working a lot on here in Texas. So on the healthcare policy side, um, one of the issues, and, and I and I'm obviously very pro Texas. I moved here, but whenever you have one party in charge of a state, sometimes that party gets influences. And so one of the influences in Texas is the health systems and insurance companies are very connected with the Republican Party. And they stop a lot of competition, and so I, you know, you know, in my view, healthcare costs would not go up nearly as much if it was easier to compete with the hospitals. If you had more telemedicine, more innovation, if you had APIs, you know, into the data to allow people to build apps. Um, are, 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 are you a fan of like using innovation in healthcare to make it more affordable as well? Is that part? Is that part of the answer? Of course, telemedicine. I've been a huge supporter of, and I was for some of the easing of the regulatory barriers that didn't allow Medicare doctors to get paid for telemedicine. I think those changes were good. They should be uh, permanent. I think telemedicine uh, is a, a potential uh, cost uh, is a saver. I'm for innovation in drugs. Obviously, you have to look at what uh, was achieved with these vaccines and think mm -hmm. that was a remarkable achievement for humanity. Uh, I'm for other types of innovation in medicine that could uh, reduce costs and make medicine uh, better. So I, I, I'm absolutely open to that. One of the policies I'm pretty interested in right now is if people had a right to electronic access to their to their billing and to their health records. And so, you know, you know, the Obama administration paid all the hospitals to put the electronic health record systems in, but it didn't require them to open up. And these systems are notoriously difficult to build on top of. I, I, I build a lot of companies. I, I, we'd all love to build healthcare companies that could take people's data and give them more personalized treatment, give them more ways to shop and save money with it with payers. But right now we're not allowed to get that data. Are you, I don't know if you've looked into this, would you, are you generally a fan of maybe giving people or let rights to some kind of electronic access to their information? Absolutely. And I, I've been hearing this for the last 10, 15 years. And it, every time I go to a doctor, I still end up having to explain everything uh, from uh, the scratch, right? I mean, you have to fill like, out the form 10 times. It yeah, drives me crazy. You know, so it's a, and I've moved around a bunch, and so it's it's never happened. I mean, so if there's something that you could have an electronic record that then you can, uh, with consent, give to doctors and transfer around your file, I think that's just uh, would 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 help. I've drawn up legislation for this in a few states where I have the governors on my side. It sounds like you. It sounds like maybe you'll have to get your feedback on this legislation. Maybe you'd be a fan of it if it's if it's pushing this in the right way. Absolutely. I, I'd love to support that legislation. What I've heard is that it's a technological issue, not a legislative issue, but maybe it's both. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think I, I think it's gone to the point where it's easy enough technologically, but the companies that control the health records don't want to do it because they think they have a profit advantage if they keep the data to themselves. And so so, yeah. they, so they pretend they're open, but they're not really open. You know how this is. They say one thing and yeah. then it's the other. So I think we have to, you know, I'm generally like very much don't force people to do things, but this is so important for the country that I think we should just force them to do it. So maybe we could talk I'm, about that. <laughs> I appreciate that. As a principle, I'm for decentralization. I mean, it's one of the reasons I've been largely supportive of cryptocurrency, even though they're, you know, I'm not, not uh, an evangelist, but anything that uh, puts more, uh, gives more agency, more, uh, power, more information in the hands of individuals, I think is a good thing. I love it. So we're going to take that and, and then we're, I want to take decentralization and more power in the hands of individuals. Does that mean you're a fan of educational choice? <laughs> well, <laughs> charter, you, school, charter schools. <laughs> or or, 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 or how, about, how, no, how about this? Just put charter schools aside for a second. How about choice for poor kids? What if you could go into areas, because your know, rich kids have choice, right? My, our, my kids, I'm successful enough. My kids have your choice. Your kids yeah. have choice. What if you think parents making under 75000 a year, what if we gave them choice? What if we said they could take the money that the government's paying for their schools and use it on any accredited school? They don't have to go to their crappy public school they happen to be tied to this where, where most of the kids can't read. They could, do, go, they could take their kids wherever they want nearby. Are you, are you a fan of things I, like that? I, I, I I rather I, I'm for choice within the public school system of charter schools, which, by the way, is a position uh, that is not shared by a lot of Democrats. Yep. I, you know, I'm sort of where Cory Booker was yep. is on that uh, on that issue of public I choice within public schools. 
uh, I'm not where you are, which is, you know, let's just I mean, cho- let's just have choice. Well, I want, I want reason- more. I want more competition, but you're afraid the competition would break. You're, <laughs> you're afraid these new schools would be too crazy, right? Or, or, or what? I, I, well, I, I went to public school. That was a very good public school. Me too. And I'd love to get uh, people up to, to that level. If 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 I thought that uh, you could uh, have that and and have this choice. Uh, fine, but the challenge is you're going to have a few people who take advantage of it, and then there would be even a further deterioration of the place where 90% of people go, public school. And here's, Joe, why mm-hmm. I believe in public schools. I mean, I, mm-hmm. you, you know, there's a philosophical difference. I think it would be a real problematic for the country if we just had all private education, because there's someone who ought to teach every kid about the Gettysburg Address and about I Have a Dream and about our Constitution and about the Declaration of Independence and public yep. schools create some place of commonality. Yep. And to me, that's part of the fabric of America. I agree. Should, should we, I guess, I guess there's probably some disagreement in our public schools about what we should teach. And it tends to be, it tends to be whoever controls them. You know, so for example, I think we should teach a lot about the authoritarian problems of the 20th century, both from the right authoritarian and the left authoritarian. So I think we should teach about what happened that was bad, you know, in, in Venezuela and Cuba in you know, in, 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 but we should also teach about the kind of the problems with right authoritarian governments in Chile and stuff. And then we should show the outcomes. Like well, maybe, maybe you know, we should start with just making sure every student knows where those countries are on a map. That's right? probably, that, that's probably, that's probably, yeah, there's the different levels of this, which is the problem. That's fair. I guess you, I guess you, I guess you can't really teach about what's going on Camp Chia until you know where the hell these things are. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to come back. To progressive capitalism, I like that you call yourself a progressive capitalist, Ro. Uh, what what is what does that mean? What does that mean in action for like like so you you, you disagree a lot with both sides, right? Like 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 where where, where are you when you're when you're progressive capitalist? What kind of things you're pushing for? It's that I believe that markets fundamentally uh, have a moral worth, and let me tell you why. Uh, I don't think that uh, a person's freedom is fully realized if they always have to have their decision uh, subject to the collective will. It could be that the collective will, certainly of Congress, is wrong and that we want people to depart from that. And so markets mm-hmm. markets have their own uh, constraints, right? You're still subject to the consumer preference. So it's not like yep. you can be an eccentric genius and uh, have s- success, but you have more flexibility, more options to maximize your individual flourishing. So the, 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 I actually defend markets is part of your of, of freedom as part of a, a human flourishing but uh, where i call myself progressive is i say there have to be some building blocks to, for you to be able to do that you need to have uh, proper health care you need to have proper education you need to ha- live in a safe neighborhood uh, you need to have nutrition and there i think that the government has a role uh, in, in in doing that and i also believe that the government has a role in investing in long-term research development uh, and so that uh, I, I have a stronger view of the role of government than most people who believe just in markets. Yep, and, and, no, and, and very reasonable. If you look at, so technology, as you know, is a very powerful deflationary force. Over the last several decades, the areas where you've had technology and markets with the cost of cell phones or software or TVs, you know, all, everything has dropped. But the sectors where government's really involved and where government's kind of playing a role like education, and healthcare, like these places have gotten more expensive. Shouldn't you have more competition and, and deregulation in those places to make them cheaper as well? Or, or, or how do you think about that? Well, I, I'd say use technology, but partly it's harder, right? I mean, uh, education, you know, with the MOOCs uh, and, and technology and remote classrooms, we've seen how difficult that is. I don't, I don't, I haven't talked to many parents who are like, yay, remote classrooms, let's just have education go virtual. Mm-hmm. So I think that there are h- higher costs to education. Same with, with medicine. Uh, am I open to the use of technology to, to, to improve that, to the use of, uh, of competition? But I'm not, look, Stanford, you know, where I taught and you went, you know, the reason it costs so much is partly it's, it's like going to a living in a five star hotel. Right. I mean, I'm not sure that that's competition. It's, a, you know, it's what you prioritize in terms of athletic facilities and dorm rooms. And, you know, so I, I think these are complex issues of why you've had such inflation in those sectors. No, that's fair. You probably heard where, where some of my friends and I with the near, Neil Ferguson and Barry Weiss are trying to com- create a competitor to Stanford now in, in Austin here. You heard are about there, this? The University I of Austin. I did not hear about it. Yeah, it's a new There's new another university. column about, oh, look, the best and brightest are going to Austin. 
let me tell you, Stanford's a hard hard to compete it's against. It's gonna be I, hard to compete and, against. It's true, but I, you know, all, yeah. all of this though, like Silicon Valley is leaving. You know, the Ted Cruz narrative. They're all leaving to Texas. I mean, give me a break. Silicon Valley's market value has gone up forty percent, forty percent in the last two years. Eleven trillion dollars of market. Well, there's cap. there's a lot of there's a lot of money printing going on the last <laughs> last last two years ago <laughs> too. Everything's going up in value, bro. It's uh, that's fair that's, though. Uh, well, I still consider you a Californian, Joe. Oh, well, well, we're, we're, <laughs> <laughs> that. I, I, I guess I, I think I think I, I know is a Californian. I think I, I, oh, he girl. actually he actually moved here too. He moved here too. Oh, did he? He did. Right. He did. No, I, I'm flattered though. I, I got three more three more things for you before you end, real oh. quick. Uh, one, clean energy and and nuclear. Uh, what is, is nuclear clean energy? Are you a fan of nuclear? Do you think we can innovate there? How are you thinking about that? I think nuclear has to be part of the uh, solution. I mean, I, I don't think it can be the old solution, but the inter intergovernmental panel of climate change says nuclear has to be part of the energy mix. Uh, and, you know, I know uh, fusion has been the long dream of, of folks, and I, I hear there are certain, certain experiments that are succeeding, but uh, it's still a it's still a challenge, but I'm I'm for putting money into research. Yeah, you know a lot of these small fission reactors, you could actually use spent nuclear fuel that's already been used in a fission reaction and use it again in these new small fission plants. And there's enough of that spent fuel to power the whole U.S. for 100 years. So it's, it seems it seems to me like it's like it's a positive area. I don't know if you're following that stuff, but I think it's I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, I'm I'm open to it. I'm not I'm not a uh, someone who says okay everything has to be on 100 percent without. Uh, future because I follow a lot of the science and even, you know, anyone who's watched who's a hardcore environmentalist, I would just say, look at the intergovernmental panel of climate change yep. and they say nuclear has to be part awesome. of the mix. Awesome. Qu quick, quick question on, you know, 2012, you wrote the book on entrepreneurial nation, why manufacturing is still key to America's future. A decade later, what's your assessment of U.S. manufacturing? Are we losing ground? Is manufacturing something that's, that, that's it's still really important to our future? Very important. And we're losing ground. And one of my concerns is the rise of China and our vulnerability on things like semiconductor chips on a huge supply chain. So we ought to be bringing some of it back to the United States or at least to ally countries. One bill I'm very excited that I'm working with Senator Rubio on is to have the Federal Financing Bank, which basically can lend things to, to, to different agencies, uh, lend to companies if they are building factories that are critical to the United States. And I and we could set up 50 factories across the United States in advanced manufacturing. Rubio and I are working on it, so it'll be bipartisan. And that's the type of thing that I think uh, people will uh, support. I'll have to ask you guys, you know, you know, Bob Nelson and I started a company last year that's raised billions of dollars that's that's built, uh, it's hired a few thousand people to build advanced biomanufacturing in the US. We opened five big plants beginning of last year, Moderna, is working with us, so I get. So, so I'm, I'm a fan of that stuff. We did it. We did it without government money, but maybe I should get some free <laughs> government money, like Elon, huh? <laughs> well, well it's a, it's an, it's not free. Uh, you, you have to pay it back. But but okay. yeah, there's nothing wrong with that if you're creating jobs and 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 I you know China gives tons of money and a lot of these other yep. companies do. And uh, I'm all for innovative entrepreneurs, but if you're creating factories and jobs and helping America industrialize, then government should be a partner. Cool. You know, I, I, you know, we started American Optimist Row to push back against the wave of pessimism and division that's sweeping across our, our country. Um, a lot of people are frustrated. They see things, you know, they see a lot of the government feels like it's broken to some people. It feels like it's it's not working. What should give people hope that good governance is possible? And and what are, what are some of the areas where we're seeing the government really, be, you know, be more competent and, and do a good job? Well, this is still the greatest country in the world. I had a tweet last night that. Uh, was somewhat quant contrarian, and I uh, got some criticism, but I, uh, people can look at it. I said that January 6th is actually about American strength and resilience, because at 3.40 a.m. on January 7th, you had a Republican vice president declare that the Democratic ticket had beaten his ticket and declare that Democratic ticket as president. That's something all Americans should celebrate. The reality is we're going to become the first multiracial, multiethnic democracy in the world. Britain, they're almost 87% white. Canada, 80 some percent white. Australia, 80 some percent white. We're 60% white, non-Hispanic. We're the most diverse country, people from all different faiths. And I guess when I look at my story, born of Indian immigrant parents, 
born uh, in, in 1976 to, in Philadelphia, and then at the age of 40, an Indian American of Hindu faith is elected to represent arguably the most economic prosperous place in the world. That is a story of American possibility. Uh, and so, yes, we have challenges, uh, but uh, don't, other generations have had far more difficult challenges from World War II to the Civil War, uh, to the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, our challenge is how do we perfect multiracial democracy in this country? I love it. Bro, that was a great conversation. This is a model for civil discourse. Hope we can have more of these between people who might not agree on, on everything, but agree that America is our country and we want to make it great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.